When we look at churches where things go really bad, there, you, you don't walk away from this. I mean, this was definitely my experience at Mar- with the Mars Hill thing. You don't walk away from this going, oh, all these people are just sort of villains and monsters, and um, they they wanted to hurt people and they want you know whatever. No, they were captivated by uh, they were captivated by a certain kind of story, a certain kind of vision. And that story and vision justified actions that, that ended up being very harmful for a lot of people. Welcome to the Setzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of today. My name's Daniel Yang, National Director of Churches of Welcome at World Relief, and today we're talking with Mike Cosper. Mike's known for producing and hosting the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. He serves as the Director of Podcasts at Christianity Today and co-hosts The Bulletin. Mike's authored several books, including Land of My Sojourn, The Landscape of a Faith Lost and Found, and his latest is The Church in Dark Times, Understanding and Resisting the Evil that Seduced the Evangelical Movement. If you enjoy our interviews, make sure you like and follow us on Apple Podcasts. Now let's go to Ed Setzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Dean of the Talbot School of Theology. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Mike Cosper, we have been, like, I've known you since you were a teenager, right? I mean, wasn't it like 19 yeah. years old? You were over my house when I was a professor for in Louisville for three years. You, you never had me to your house, but, but I, I met you in my my friend Nathan Quillo. Shout out to Nathan Quillo Nathan. and Quill's Coffee. Uh, I met you in, in Nathan's living room. Um, oh, okay. It was a living room. Okay. I thought it was yeah, my yeah. house, because, uh, but okay. That, that's fascinating. Met, met there. You're just a kid. I have never been invited to the Setzer home. Well, there's, there's, a, there's the restraining order. But anyway, um, <laughs> moving on from there. So, um, so you, and now, I mean, it's so funny to kind of watch your journey. Uh, first of all, I make, I make fun of you in one of my, I mean, years ago, I had this road sermon that you've heard me do. And, uh, and I talk about, um, you know, sojourn and, and your music that you played. And then you didn't want to sing any, you know, any commercial music. And then the joke I make in the term is, and now they have their own, you know, they have their own album out. And so, and so you knew that, but, but, and we kept in touch, but your life is, is we're going to get to the topic of the book in just a minute, but your life's kind of a, a weird journey that in many ways, of course, shapes the the tone and tenor of the book. So you've been involved in all this media for two decades. You know, uh, how does this kind of shape your perspective on the issues facing our churches today? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. The book is, the book is much more a reflection of how those views have been shaped rather than shaping of the, of the views. Um, but yeah, I mean, the church today is a media phenomenon. Like the church has to function as a media phenomenon, whether they like it or not. And, you know, any church that the the minute you start putting your sermons available online or sending emails or whatever else, like you're, you're trafficking in, you know, this, this, this new normal, um, which can be used for good and can be used for ill. And, and, um, yeah, that's that. That <laughs> it's a complicated, it's a complicated question, I guess. Um, yeah, but it's. I mean, it's it's complicated. But you're like you've rushed into all of that. You know, it's it's the idea of the. I mean, even your expression that you know the church right. is a media experience now, which is something that we wouldn't have said 50 years ago. 100%. And so, uh, you know, I'm not saying you've rushed in uncritically, but you've certainly rushed in. I mean, the one of the world's leading podcasts critiquing church. Um, now you have your own weekly podcast. You've done different forms of media. So, I mean, has that has has walking through all that? Like, how's your heart? I mean, is it is it? I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm, I think it's great. I think it's opportunities at all of the above. Cause I mean, again, the title of the book is, you know, not exactly sunshine and roses here. It's the church right. in dark times, which right. we're going to get to the subtitles, understanding and resisting the evil that seduced the evangelical movement. But media certainly plays a part in your book and in this journey. So what are your current posture towards the very thing that you're involved in? Yeah. I mean, I, I make a point in the book. I mean, for what it's worth, like I make a point in the book to, to really sort of hold out the example of Billy Graham as somebody who from, from the very beginnings of modern media understood its complexity, understood its temptations, um, really kind of created a whole set of boundaries and restrictions around himself to try to protect himself from the temptations that came from media. Um, and at the same time, 
you, you can't understand the Billy Graham phenomenon without, without recognizing that it was a media phenomenon. Like he, he saw it as an opportunity and unapologetically embraced the opportunity of, of media. So, you know, it's like anything, like there are, there are trade-offs and for the church to function, um, for the church to function in our particular moment, um, they have to figure out, okay, what are we going to do about media? Um, maybe, you know, there are some churches that are like, they're going to embrace that like sort of particular Baptist, fundamentalist Baptist posture and say, we're not doing anything online and we would never do multiple services and we certainly wouldn't, you know, live stream anything or whatever. But that's the exception. The rule is churches trying to figure out, okay, how do we use this stuff judiciously? And, um, you know, what? Well, well, that's an element of what the book is talking about. The book is trying to sort of push at issues that are larger and broader than that, like what the the framing behind all of that. Right, right. That says like, hey, what 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 is the church what is the church about? What is what is possible for the church? What what can the church accomplish? And when when those questions, when the answers to those questions become really grandiose, that becomes really dangerous. Yeah, and I think what you know it does address those questions, but also deeply addresses what happened to the church. And so, you know, I, so part of that, I want to get a little background. In a sense, I'm also, I guess, asking what happened to you that you think that the church is in dark times. Um, mm. What is it? The famous question: Who hurt you? Um, but <laughs> you know, the uh, of course, you did the rise and fall of Mars Hill, which just, and we've had you on a podcast to talk about that and. Mm -hmm. Did that relate in any way, or how did it relate to your decision to write the the church in dark times? And and maybe if you can, what about your own church experience? How does that relate to writing the church in dark times? Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, for for those who are unfamiliar with it, like my my story, I helped plant a church uh, uh, under the leadership of wise mentors like Ed Stetzer. Um, I don't think I was your mentor. And, to, be, to be clear, I think we—I didn't even know where we met. So let's not put me in the mentor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll still blame you. That's so, fair. year two thousand helped plant a church. I was on staff there for fifteen years. Um, our our church was one of the like we experienced, and I mean this genuinely. Like we experienced the best of the church planting boom of the two thousands. We um, we planted at a time where there weren't a lot of churches like us in the city of Louisville. The church blew up. Um, by the time I left, we had almost 4,000 people meeting at five locations, um, live preaching at every location. We never did video venue. Um, and then, you know, the church had this really vibrant arts and culture ministry as well. Like we, we ran a center for the arts and we started Sojourn Music and you can go to Spotify and check out Sojourn Music and you'll be able to see what we did over the years. A lot of a lot of original songs, a lot of hymns, things like that. Um, I you know I treasure those days. I mean, I treasure that experience. It was um, some of the best years of my life were, were were spent in that ministry, and you know, I it it ended in a season where the church went through some unhealth. The church was probably unhealthy for the last two or three years that I was there, and then. Um, within two or three years of my exit, uh, went through a bunch of transformations. And I think it's, I'm really happy to say like, I'm still a member at this church. I still attend, uh, a Sojourn campus. And I think all of those Sojourn pastors would say like, yeah, we went through a hard season and we, um, came out the other side in a, in a, in a solid place. That definitely has affected the way I've approached it, it definitely affected the way that I approached the Mars Hill story. Right. Because just, what I recognized in the Mars Hill people, story. A little connection with people is that Sojourn was an Acts 29 church. And so some right. connection there, not now. And I wasn't, it didn't stay for too long. But but so sometimes that connection is, uh, you know, and then you do the rise and fall of Mars Hill. So talk to us about that. Right. Yeah. So we, we joined uh, Acts 29 after we had been planted, we were not planted by them, but we, we joined them in like 04. I think Darren Patrick recruited us to come into the network in 04. And then we, we left around 2010 um, as things were starting to get a little wild and hairy in there. And and because we were kind of compelled and uh, felt called to, to start our own church planting network with a, a, a different vision. Um, but yeah, that definitely affected it. And and what, what that did for me, I mean, the reason... I mean, 
for sure, the reason that I was able to do what I did with the rise and fall of Mars Hill was because during those years of participation in Acts 29, I was able to build a lot of relationships with pastors uh, in the Acts 29 network and at Mars Hill that became kind of key figures, key voices in that, in that story. And, um, and, and I would just say that, like, I think the importance of the rise and fall of Mars Hill is that it's a story that's that's very familiar to lots of pastors mm-hmm. in lots of different situations. Um, not just Mark Driscoll, not just Acts 29, not just a certain kind of church, brand of church. Like there is a, there, the, Mars Hill, like what you see in Mars Hill is that there's a way in which like a certain ideology kind of takes hold of the leaders of a church and creates a permission structure in which all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, badly motivated activity can take place from there. Yeah, and this is, and that's a key theme that kind of runs throughout the book. Um, and you talk, we'll talk some about the banality of evil and more. Um, but when I think most people read the books coming out uh, after the election, we're recording this before the election. The reason I say that is uh, we don't know who's going to be elected president uh, at the time of this recording, but this will be out like right after the election. Um, but, and we but, still may not know who the president is when it comes out either. That's fair. That's fair. Wow. Wow. That hurt. That hurt. That, that wounded my soul right there, brother. I'm not sure I'm ready for that again. Um, but, but so here's the thing when, when people read the church in dark times, I will, I, I know that people who don't know you might think, oh, this is a book that the right wing would write or publish, you know, particularly maybe even on the, you know, more far right and say we're in dark times because the rise of progressive and liberal ideologies is crushing. And, you know, we, this this could be our last election. We're going to lose our freedom. It's, it's dark time. And then people on the left would say, well, you know, yeah, the, the authoritarianism. And if, if you know, if we we're going to we're going to lose our freedom, you know, Nazi, all this sort of stuff. So it's dark times. And then there's people I don't know. I wouldn't say center, but they could be like center and and to each side, they're like, just the craziness all around us is dark times. So what, I, and again, I think, you know, people, you know, if people follow you on Twitter, uh, you know, they, they've seen you, and I found helpful you talking about this as an election of extremes and, and you know, o- overplaying to the base and all that sort of stuff. So knowing that we don't know who's going to be president, but there's hopefully will be have decided by then, what's the dark times? Is it political, uh, overwhelmingly, partly? Let's start there. Yeah, so so there's there's a sense in which like the the dark times have nothing to do with politics whatsoever. Um, uh, the politics are, I would even say, like the politics are downstream of other sort of cultural realities in which a a a world full of people who are detached from uh, uh, detached from a sense of like uh, meaning and purpose. Um, they're looking for something, you know, David Foster Wallace has this great quote where he says, we're all dying to give ourselves away to something. And that's a really dangerous reality. Um, particularly in a world where, where, where people don't have these like deeply rooted senses of connection to, to place, to family, to country, to vocation, to church, to, to whatever else. And the, the power, and, and again, like, the reason Mars Hill was such a great example of this, the power of Mars Hill was it provided a story for lots of people, especially young men, but but certainly broader than young men. It, it provided a place for them to find like a sense of story and purpose and belonging. Um, and it was it was wrapped around a certain vision of Christianity, a certain vision of masculinity. Um which was really embodied by and represented by Mark Driscoll. And the problem was because it was so, so enmeshed like that vision for what the church was about, because it was so enmeshed with Mark, it couldn't outlive Mark. So when Mark had to, you know, when, when Mark left, the church collapsed and fell apart. And, and we've seen similar examples of this in other places. Um, you see this in political movements all the time. Like if you look throughout the 20th century, you see political movements that kind of function in the same way. So what I'm trying to warn the church with, with a book like this is, is not to say like politics are the problem or a certain kind of church or church growth strategy is the problem. What I'm trying to say is I'm trying to say 
ideology is the problem. These grandiose visions where we say, look, if we just if we can just get this one thing right, we can reach the city, we can reach the world, we can transform all of these things. That grandiosity itself is what uh, what I think becomes so destructive down the line. Yeah. Well, and I think that it's not hard to see that people are becoming much more ideologically motivated. Now, people say that because they probably think someone else got, uh, they, there's always this cycle of blame. I, I wrote an article in Outreach Magazine, my editor's column, uh, on the great sort, where in the past, you know, people sorted themselves uh, denominationally in the 50s. You can go to Lutheran church, you go to another town, you find a Lutheran church. They sorted themselves out um, probably more theologically in, and methodologically in the 80s and beyond. I want to find something that's, if I'm an evangelical, something that holds similar beliefs and sort of worships like I'm used to worshiping, but you know, I could become Methodist and go non-denominational or whatever. But today, increasingly, people are sorting themselves ideologically. So pastors who are listening all have had people in the last five years leave their church to go to churches that are going to be more ideologically aligned with the people who left. And, you, you know, same, I mean, literally they got the same theological beliefs, even worship the same, but I need someone who punches harder to the left, or I need somebody who speaks up on issues that are important about my views of justice, or whatever it, must be, it may be. So part of that we've seen, but you've talked some more about how at its extremes, and you talk a lot about the power of the ideological movement itself. So, uh, and, and so what, characterizes them and what makes them so dangerous? Because I think, I mean, I have an ideology. Uh, so what makes ideological movements so dangerous? Yeah, you know, something that I've, I've, I've thought a lot about this, and I think if I, uh, if I had another round of edits on the book, I probably would take the time to do this. In well, the I book. know your editor, so you know, we could talk to her. <laughs> yeah, so. well, um, <laughs> and by the way, she wrote a book called Celebrities for Jesus. I'm coming back now because I was going to, and what was fascinating, I, she interviewed me for the book about, about Billy Graham. And when the book came out, it was the greatest marketing thing I've ever received. So if you're watching this, you, 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 can, you can say that it's the greatest marketing, Caitlin, what, I've ever seen, Caitlin Beatty. She sent me, and I guess everybody, because I saw people put on Twitter, like an album, like a, like a full-size record from Billy Graham, Celebrity for Jesus. And so I'm guessing whoever she talked to did that. So anyway, super cool. Sorry. But back to your, if you had more time to make edits, so sorry for yeah, that. Yeah. So, so what I would do is I would distinguish between like lowercase I ideology and okay. uppercase I ideology. Okay. And when I, when I talk about ideology in the book and, and the ideology that I think is so problematic, it would be this uppercase I thing. And Miroslav Volf actually has defined it. He said, um, I think he's provided the best definition of it. He said it's a little idea that's supposed to change the world. It's like you have this, you have this one sentence, uh, uh, this one sentence vision that says if we just get this issue right, it's going to transform everything. So, in politics, you know, in the 20th century, in politics, what you saw was for for Stalin, it was like you you got to get rid of the bourgeoisie and the capitalists, and then you know, socialist utopia is on the other, or, you know, communist utopia is on the other side of all of this. Um, for Hitler, it was, you got to get rid of the Jews. Um, they're this parasitic race in, in Europe. If we can get rid of the Jews, um, then the, the, the superior, the superiority of the Aryan race is going to prove itself. And, you know, the third Reich is going to reign forever and ever, blah, blah, blah. The church does weird kind of funny versions of this. Hmm. Um, and, you know, and again, like Mars Hill ends up being an interesting example of, of the case because Mark's whole idea was, he, he said this all the time. He, he would say 90% of the world's problems are caused by young men, which is true. I, I mean, I think he's actually right on that. I, I think Mark was right on all kinds of stuff, frankly. Um, but what, what he then did was he then said this idea Build a church around young men. Um, reach the young men. You're going to change the city. You're going to change the world. Became this like controlling feature. And so, what what an ideology does is it is it then creates this kind of circular logic where anytime a criticism comes in, hey, maybe you should be more sensitive to the needs of the women in your church. It enters into the sort of the jaws of this logic and gets chewed up and gets you know. And then the response that comes back is. Oh, so you're, you know, you're a feminist or you're a liberal or you're weak or you're not man enough or all this. And like anybody inside that church would tell you those kinds of responses were very, very, very common. 
for 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 critics. Um, and worse, I mean, there's worse, uglier versions of it that I won't sort of repeat here. Um, that happens all the time, though. It happens with all kinds of ideas. I think I actually think Bill Hybels is a really interesting example of uh, an, an ideological vision capturing a church and and leading its growth. For for Hybels, it was you know. Hybels had this origin story that he loved to tell, and he told it all the time. I, I had a path into the business world. I was going to be a successful businessman, but I put all that aside. I, I put all that aside to, uh, to plant a church, um, and and so his church became about reach business leaders and entrepreneurs, and you'll change the world. And um, what 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 becomes very easy like part of what ideology does is it can be you know it's like a it, it's 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 like a black hole like it bends gravity in its in its direction the logic of a certain kind of story starts to bend gravity it starts to bend morality so that you know when when concerns come up or when conflicts come up or when the leader themselves starts to behave in ways that are disqualifying you the, the gravity of the ideology. This is so important, right? People are going to hell. We don't want to, <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't want to disrupt the momentum of the mission and the movement because people are going to hell. Um, and, and so that's important enough that we will ignore whatever the yellow flags or, or red flags are. And it happens over and over and over again in ministries. You can, you and I could probably sit here for, an hour and name names and get very depressed doing so. Yeah. And it is depressing. I mean, it is, but, but and, and I would say that, I mean, the book is not a sequel to the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, but it does deal a lot with issues of church abuse, but not just church abuse is bad. And, but what, what is the ideological frameworks that create the cultural context where church abuse is, is, is it can happen. And, and it, it appears that, that was what was, that was uh, what was so important to me was yeah. uh, the question I got over and over again is how does this happen? Right. How does the church find itself in a place like this? The Setzer Church Leaders Podcast is part of the Church Leaders Podcast Network, which is dedicated to resourcing church leaders in order to help them face the complexities of ministry today. The Church Leaders Podcast Network supports pastors and ministry leaders by challenging assumptions, by providing insights and offering practical advice and solutions and steps that will help church leaders navigate the variety of cultures and contexts that we're serving in. Learn more at churchleaders.com slash podcast network. And the more I pressed into it, the more, I mean, ironically, like the more it sort of led me to look at political ideology and, mm-hmm. and how people get captivated by all of that. And, um, and to recognize that the, the structures, like the, the ideological structures, the, the imaginary structures of, of such a thing, the parallels were, uh, w- were really, really striking. And, you know, the book focuses a lot on Hannah Arendt and her thought. Yeah, I want to get, let, let's unpack that a little bit with the banality of evil and, you yeah. know, because you were drawn to her. Tell us why, why her concept, her, this concept applies to the crisis we're facing in evangelical churches. Yeah. So Hannah Arendt, she was a um, 20th century German social theorist, German Jewish social theorist. She, um, you know, she fled Nazi Germany uh, uh, because she was doing work as a, as a dissident and got caught, she managed to sort of talk her way out of, uh, uh, Gestapo cap- captivity. Um, it, that's a whole story in and of itself. She flees to France. Uh, she, she works to, to help escaping Jews, uh, from France for a number of years. And then eventually when France is, is captured, she, she flees to England. Um, and then she, in 1950, she publishes a book called The Origins of Totalitarianism, which it's one of those books where it's like, there's a lot of theories about kind of how, how the Nazi thing happened, how Stalinism happened and, and, and all the rest. And it doesn't matter where you land on the spectrum of, of political theory around that stuff. You end up having to deal with Arendt. Like she's, she's one of the Titans of all of this. Um, 
then, you know, part of what's really interesting is that when the Israeli government uh, kidnapped Adolf Eichmann from Argentina and brought him to Israel to stand trial, I think it was 1961 that, that, that they captured him and all of that. She ends up going and covering the trial for the New Yorker and a series of articles that she, um, that she wrote for the New Yorker, sort of dispatches on the trial were eventually published uh, in the New Yorker. And then uh, as a book called Eichmann in Jerusalem. And that book is the book where um, the phrase, the banality of evil was coined. Um, and her, what, what's so interesting about the whole deal is that, you know, she had spent years trying to understand what was behind the Nazi phenomenon and um, the evil of the phenomenon. And in 1950, she writes about it and she refers to it as radical evil. It's a reference to, it's actually a reference to Kant's work of a, a certain kind of political all consuming evil that can, that can emerge when morality goes unrestrained. But then she she basically does a correction, like a self-correction in, in the 1960s after she encounters Eichmann. Cause she sees him on the, she sees him on the witness stand and she's like, this guy's not radical evil. This guy's banal. He's like so normal. He's so boring. He's never had an original thought. All he does is he spouts cliches and catchphrases and, um, his, to the extent that he's an anti-Semite, he's an anti-Semite because, those are the stories he's been told and he's consumed and owned and all the rest. Now she doesn't let him off the hook. The last chapter of uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem is actually her. She, she, she essentially, she critiques the Israeli uh, judgment against him and, and the reasons for, for which they sent him to, to be hanged. But then she offers her own uh, condemnation and her own justification for his hanging um, based on his thoughtlessness and so, so I, I mean, I've been enamored with Arendt's work since I was in my early, early twenties and, um, just been captivated by her way of kind of seeing the world. And what I think, what I think the parallels are is when we look at churches where things go really bad, they're, you, you don't walk away from this. I mean, this was definitely my experience at Mar with the Mars Hill thing. You don't walk away from this going, Oh, all these people are just sort of villains and monsters, and um, they they wanted to hurt people, and they want you know whatever. No, they were captivated by uh, they were captivated by a certain kind of story, a certain kind of vision, and that story and vision justified actions that that ended up being very harmful for a lot of people. And that's what Arendt's work is all about, and that's why she abandoned the idea of radical evil, and she said no that. Evil is banal. It's empty. It's hollow. There's no bottom to it, which which I think actually has a lot of resonance with Christian theology of evil, where we talk about evil as as being more about the absence of God um, than you know than than some power of its own. Hmm. I was I was struck by that phrase in that part of what you wrote. I was I was preaching a few weeks ago, I guess a few months ago now, in a church in or uh, in, in Florida. And uh, in Orlando, Florida, and and it was not a like it was, the message was not a. I didn't mention immigrants. Just I'll, I'll explain the context in just a minute. Um, I just talking about it's kind of gospel truth that we want to love people and we can different than us and, and you know and how we might do that and how the Christian role in that. And this woman came up afterwards and just was distraught, and she said, "Pastor, I, I just I, I don't. All I heard today was that I." shouldn't hate immigrants. And I've been listening to, to, as you said, talk radio. And all I've grown is just this hatred towards immigrants. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and she said, first it was illegal immigrants. Now it's immigrants in general. And, and, and she said, so what do I, what do I do? Remember, I didn't mention immigrants, legal or illegal in the, you know, praying for people who are different, trying to engage them. And, 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 I, and I said to her, you know, that maybe that's what the Lord has for you. Is it prompting your feeling? Is it a conviction of the Holy Spirit? And I said, so, and, and she said, you know, because I, I do, I'm really concerned about our country's um, uh, open borders, et cetera, et cetera. But in your message, I just felt I've gone too far. And I said, well, let me just say, I think Christians uh, can and should uh, debate and, and have opinions about border security. Well, none of that's wrong. 
But if you felt your heart has been overtaken by something, where is that coming from? And she pointed to radio she's been listening to. And I says, well, I think ultimately that's the, that your ideology is trumping your Christianity. And so it's it's kind of taking over what's there. And I think at the end of the day, she got, we had a beautiful time of prayer. But what was fascinating to me was, was she was really down this rabbit hole and this is what seems to happen. So you talk about, and you can respond to that too, but you talk about the church needing to practice anti-ideology, which is, man, I think people on the left and the right would say, but there's got to be some ideological ramifications of biblical truths. Um, you might use sure. it differently, but, you know, uh, but uh, so, so talk to me about that. Well, how is it anti-ideology and how would you like help a pastor? Because that was my encounter, right? I, I wanted, I was, I thank God for that encounter. I'd love to see more of that kind of encounter, but how do pastors and church leaders get there and where does anti-ideology fit in? Well, I, I really think it comes back to um, telling a story that is bigger than us, bigger than our moment, bigger than our country, bigger than our, uh, certainly bigger than the next election. Um, you know, uh, the, the beauty of the liturgy, the beauty of the historic liturgy is that it tells this, it tells exactly that kind of a story, uh, every single week where it's framing you inside this, you know, I mean, what's the, what's the line when, when they, when they serve the Eucharist and the mass, but, but the Presbyterians use it and the Anglicans use it and lots of people use it. Baptists should use it. They say, um, as, as the mass is being served, as the Eucharist is being served, they say, um, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So past, present, future is all present there. And to me, that kind of, that declaration, which is part of a much larger liturgy that's telling that larger story, but that declaration, it just, ca it, it just casts a massive shadow over the next election or the, the current conflict or the problems at the border or, you know, whatever the controversy du jour is, it, it reminds you that like, man, there's something much, much, much bigger going on in the midst of all of this. And, you know, I think one of the unfortunate realities that that's related to this is that the church has such a short memory for, uh, for conflict, for um, persecution, for suffering, for its problems that, you know, we think being, we think being challenged in an election with ideas that we don't like or laws we don't like or whatever, we, we think of that as a crisis. And like most Christians throughout history, and frankly, like go talk to Christians in Sudan right now, yeah. they, they would be like, you know, truly rolling their eyes at our first world problems that, that we want to absolutize. But there's lots of people, there's lots of pundits and um, media figures and everything else that, that are profiting from maximalizing those kinds of crises and conflicts. And so, so yeah, so ideology plays a, a massive role because what they have to do then is they have to tell a story that absolutizes their political cause and, or absolutizes that specific conflict. And I think what, what good theology, what good preaching, what good liturgy does is it says, um, you know, in, in, well, one way to put it would be like to quote John Whitley, um, good liturgy reminds people of their deaths and prepares them for their deaths. And the reality of our death, the reality of the fact that our life is a breath, that we are dust, that we're here today and gone tomorrow, um, it's a really sobering thing around the way the church engages with not just politics, but also with church growth. Mm -hmm. Like it should really humble us around some of our aspirations of we're going to reach the city and we're going to transform this and we're going to do that. And like, I love evangelism. I love evangelists. I love, you know, conversion. I genuinely don't. I mean, this surprises people all the time. I genuinely don't have a problem with mega churches. Um, what I have a problem with is when the mega church confuses itself for the universal church and confuses its uh, purposes and its its mission with the universal church. Because once you do that, then you can justify all kinds of terrible in the name of, 
well, for the sake of the church, we got to do this, that, or the other. Um, we, we, we need to be sobered up and, and recognize that like the mission of God is not going to be, you know, accomplished because of our efforts tomorrow. It's going to be accomplished because of the efforts of the, the universal church across the globe over years, months, you know, months, years, millennia, you know, who knows how long. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I, I actually like your call to, you know, the li- kind of liturgy, liturgy of the ordinary to quote some friends of our, uh, friend of ours and more. Um, I, I guess one of the things we learned and maybe what part of why you're writing the book, one of the things we learned, I don't know, from maybe 20, the last five or 10 years is that, um, that the, the, the ecclesiology and discipleship did not hold and ideology, ideology actually won the day. People were far more discipled by their cable news choices than their local church. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting. I, I've actually said, now keeping in mind that like we have no idea how this election and the post-election response to it could be, but I think pastors have done a better job uh, in 2024 uh, because they got a little more accustomed to how to navigate some of these things. But, but I also think that it's an easier job in some ways because the ideological sorting has taken place in their churches. Exactly. So Pete, churches all across yeah. country tell me, we've got new people coming in and, 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 and other people going to other churches. So now we're sort of sorting ourselves into these ideological camps in church, which, so, okay, so it kind of leads back to this. So I, I, I like the idea of, I actually say the keys to our future are uh, elevating our, our ecclesiology and more faithfully engaging the mission. Okay. You, you could, re- I mean, I could overlay that with much of what's in your book. So you, you have these practices for healing and renewal, but simultaneously, I mean, I don't know, and these are dark and challenging times around some of these things. So if you're a pastor and church leader, which is our audience, man, where, where would you start? Uh, where would you start with, you know, cause a lot of people right now just keeping their head down, talking about things less. Some people are talking more because they trying to draw people on ideological issues. And some people are basically trying to balance all of those things. So where, where do I start? What do I do if I'm a pastor and church leader? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it actually, I think, I think for the church leader, it's the same, it's the same challenge as it is for the church. And, you know, the old, the old axiom that like, you can't, you can't lead anybody any place you haven't gone. Like I think that applies here. Um, so to me, that part, of, like the first thing I would say to pastors who are trying to figure out, okay, how do we lead through a season like this? Is like reckon with your death, right? Like reckon with the fact that uh, you, you, you know, you might die of a heart attack in your sleep in fifty years, or you might get hit by a bus tomorrow. Um, is your ministry built in such a way that it it can continue? Because the practices of the church, the life of the church, they're not dependent on your personality, your persona, your performance. They're they're dependent upon the story of the gospel and the practices, the spiritual formation practices of the church, which are worship, prayer, uh, the Lord's table, baptism, you know. Uh, the habits of discipleship and all of that. Like if those aren't, if those aren't in place, if, if, if you can look at your church and go, man, they'd be really hosed if I uh, got hit by a bus tomorrow, then that's an, that's a five alarm fire to me. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm, it, it almost sounds catchphrasy to say reckon with your death, you know, as a, as a response to that question. But but I really think like, I really think it's the answer, you know? I mean, Jonathan Edwards, this was like a daily practice for Edwards was to consider his death. What would happen when he died? What would happen to his church and his family and everything else? And where would he stand? And was he ready to stand before the judgment seat? Um, I, I just don't think it can be, I don't think you can reduce sobriety, uh, deeper than that. Um, because, because then it applies to your church as well, which is you're inviting your church to reckon with their death. And, and you know, so that's about, you know, on the one hand, that is about, like, are you ready to stand before the judgment seat of God? But it's also about what have you left behind you? Like, what has your life been about? What has mattered? And um, uh, Arthur Brooks talks about this all the time. He, he talks about the difference between, like, 
um, uh, uh, resume values versus eulogy values. You know, the things that people are going to talk about you, the, the things that people are going to say about you in your eulogy are very different than the things that you're going to put into your resume. But ultimately, the ones that, that are really going to matter are the one, are the things that people say about you in your eulogy. And, and so often, so much of what like consumes our energy and our time and our, uh, our angst and our rage and, and everything else, like we get worked up about all this stuff. And I think if we were honest to, to, with ourselves, like, boy, I sure hope nobody talks about political ideology when I'm eulogized because that doesn't matter to me. Like what matters to me is like, how have I loved my kids and my friends and my neighbors and my wife, you know? Um, I hope that's what stands out in a, in a moment like that. Um, the corruption of political ideology, the corruption of ideology of any sort, the corruption of, of, you know, what I call in the book, evangelical ideology, the, the corruption that says, um, we need to bend heaven and earth to, to grow this church because people are going to hell. You know, when that turns into a thing where you're overlooking abuses, looking the other way on, on, you know, sin and failure among leaders, justifying that kind of behavior, none of that is stuff that you're going to want to be remembered for. And, um, it's where the sort of the, the sobering encounter with our death, uh, it's so it's so key for the long term. Mike Cosper, uh, ending on a uh, imp- not exactly a high note, but uh, but an important note that maybe speaks to the the situation of our day. Uh, I die daily. Paul writes. I love that, and I appreciate you. Thanks for coming on the program. Love you, Ed. Thank you so much for having me on. We've been talking to Mike Cosper. Be sure to check out his new book, The Church in Dark Times, Understanding and Resisting the Evil that Seduced the Evangelical Movement. You can learn more about Mike at mikecosper.net. And thanks again for listening to the Setzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found a conversation today helpful, I'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review, give us a like and a follow, and that'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.